So all of last week, uh, you have been participants of a flipped classroom and you have also seen videos, answered questions, taken the knowledge quiz, started on your assignment on flipped classroom. And in the introduction, Professor Fatak talked extensively about the what and why of a flipped classroom. So let's, let's continue with this idea the rest of today. Uh, we will do some new things today and we will then move into the next topic which will help you not only for the next week but also to complete your assignments for both last week and the coming weeks. So to very briefly revise, if we had to say in a nutshell or show on one single slide what is a flipped classroom and what is not a flipped classroom or where we are coming from, uh, what you can see is this figure. This was there in one of the videos also that what happens in a traditional classroom, so this is not a flipped classroom, okay? this is a traditional classroom that most of us are used to. What happens in the class is that the teacher usually lectures, maybe there are some examples, maybe there are a few problem solving activities, but typically there is information transmission happening between the teacher and the learners. And even if I can be a little more uh, strict here, what I will say is that this information transmission is happening from the teacher to the learners because there is this traditional idea that we all have that the teacher is the expert. And Professor Fatak told you quite extensively why this idea is not really valid. And there are some times when the teachers happen to have more experience but everybody is learning together. So anyway, in a traditional classroom there is a lot of information transmission happening in the classroom. And what the teacher typically does is assign homework, some assignments, maybe a project at the end of the semester to be done outside of the class. So the actual assimilation of the material, the thinking more deeply about the material or uh, doing higher order thinking activities with the content, all this is done by students outside of class in a traditional classroom. So what flipped classroom does is essentially invert the two, okay? that the information transmission aspect of the topic of knowledge is now relegated to outside of the class and this can be done via video, screencasts, reading, internet sites, go look up this website and many other things. And the in class time, the precious in class time is spent in the assimilation part and I just mentioned why assimilation is a little harder, it is not just remembering or it is not just trying to understand some simple things, uh, students have to integrate material and they have to solve harder problems and so on. So the big advantage of doing assimilation in class is that the teacher is present and peers are present for every learner. So there is a huge community in class who can help each other and uh, who, uh, so this, this presence, physical presence of both the teacher and the peer learners is in fact much more useful and necessary for assimilation rather than just for the information transmission. So th this is something, this is a quick two minute revision of what you saw in the videos in the last one week. There was one more point related to the flipped classroom and especially about the in class part of the flipped classroom. And that was this whole idea of what is active learning and why active learning and so on. So as I just mentioned, the presence of instructors and the peers is more useful for the assimilation, for the application. Hence, we decided to move the assimilation part in class. If you now ask how to do the assimilation or what the teacher and the students are supposed to do in the class, there the answer is that in the flipped classroom, the in-class time can be devoted to tasks that promote active learning where students are the ones who are doing something, they are the ones who are drawing, solving problems, they are going beyond listening, they are going beyond writing notes. They are reflecting on their work, they are asking questions to each other, they are not only answering the teacher's questions, they are coming up with the questions, they are coming up with the answers, they are doing group work, they are being asked to explain their reasons. They are being asked to take an equation and draw graphs with respect to it. They are being asked to present their material. So there is a lot of different ways of doing active learning. Some of it we saw last week. We will do a lot more today 
and perhaps we will continue next week also and many of you might have seen it in the previous workshops. But there is an the, the purpose of this slide is there is an intimate connection between the notion of flip classroom, the core idea of flip classroom that we saw and the in class component of it which has active learning. And students are in some way prepared in a flip classroom to come and start doing activities on their own because the information transmission has happened beforehand. Okay, so having given a 5 minute brief revision for those of you who are still catching up on last week, let us actually start with an activity. For those of you who have participated in our previous workshops, you know a few things. You know that these uh, synchronous sessions are full of activities and you are now the active learners, you are not sitting and listening to us transmit lectures from here. Uh, the second thing you know is that whenever you see a blue slide like this, it means that you have to wake up and assuming that you, know, you were not awake earlier, you have to start thinking about the activity and doing the activity. So what we will do in this activity is I will briefly introduce it first, do not start doing anything yet. I will introduce it. And it is in the form of a think pair share format, which again you have encountered, if not in the previous workshops, then in last week in some of the uh, videos and some of the uh, questions, uh, knowledge quiz and so on. So I will introduce it, explain it and then we will start off the various phases. Let me just check if there are any questions before we go ahead. Okay, it seems like things are in shape. So let us begin the activity and this is again your chance of applying and assimilating the different concepts regarding flipped classroom that you have encountered uh, in the past few days. So what will be given to you are two different implementations of a flipped classroom. So I will describe to you and show you some resources. So this is essentially teacher A who implemented flipped classroom in a particular way and teacher B who did something else. So first you have to go through the two implementations. So we will spend some 5 minutes doing that. Then the goal of this activities is actually an analysis of the pros and cons of the two techniques. So for each implementation, flip classroom A as well as flip classroom B, what you need to do is to write both pros and cons and eventually you will have to come to a consensus within your remote center on which of these two implementations you think is more effective. So since most of you are engineers and scientists, you know that in a pros and cons analysis, you have to do a lot of argumentation. You have to uh, look at criteria on which you list down pros and cons, on which you identify and argue what are pro pros, what are cons, how many, which ones stronger and so on. So in addition to these two implementations, there is a list of questions. So I am just going to flash the list of questions and later you go back and you can look at the questions. So there is a list of questions for the out of class component related to size of videos, number of concepts, etc. And there is a list of questions related to the in class component related to what the students did, what the teachers did, is there active learning and so on. So these questions, by the way, we are not claiming that you have to answer yes for each of these questions. These are merely triggers for your thought in order to analyze pros and cons. So once you look at the two implementations, you can go back to this list of questions and then analyze how each of these implementations fared on these criteria. Okay, so now let us look at the implementation and there are, so just so that everybody is, you know, understands the topic and all, we have chosen a very simple school level topic of I think about 5th standard maths where uh, the topic is Pythagorean theorem, 5th, 6th, somewhere, 6th sixth sixth standard. standard, somewhere there, okay, maybe 6th standard, I have forgotten when Pythagorean theorem is taught. So what teacher A does is essentially assigns specific Khan Academy videos on Pythagorean theorem. So for those of you who may not be familiar, I think most of us at this point are familiar with Khan Academy videos. Uh, this is a suite, a whole repository of uh, videos and worked examples in uh, mostly in mathematics at the school level, There's many, many topics. So teacher A has actually given us one of the websites to go and look at. So let me try to bring that up right now. 
So, what teacher A does is uh, goes to this page which has a collection of various videos. Each of these is a video, okay, about 8 or 10 of them are there. And for this particular week, teacher A has assigned intro to Pythagorean theorem initially to watch. And I am just going to again show you what a few minutes or maybe a couple of, yeah, maybe 30 seconds of what this is about. And uh, this video, if you look at any of these pages, you can either play the video or you can even read the transcript. So, if you do not want to play the video, I do not need audio, I am just going to show you what this guy is showing us here. Let us now talk about what is easily one of the most so this side is A, I'm just going to show this you side some of is the B, here. and this side is C, as I can get. C is equal to the square root of 100. 35. So this video contains an explanation of what is Pythagorean theorem and also uh, some solved examples where different numbers of A, B, and C are given and the person, the teacher whose name is Sanman Khan here, he is solving for the third side. So, you can either watch a few minutes of the video or you can go directly to the transcript and try to understand what the video is about. So, what you have to do is just try to get a feel for what this video is about, okay. All right, let us go back to the previous page. So, teacher A assigns a watching of this video, it is about 10 minutes long, remember these are about 6 standard students. And then teacher A says to go to this Pythagorean theorem example, which essentially has one more example. So, Salman Khan, he also goes by Sal Khan. So, Sal uses the Pythagorean theorem to find the height of a right triangle with base of 9 and hypotenuse of 14. So, it is just one simple worked example. So, what this teacher A says is read the transcript, which means do not yet watch the video solve this problem. So, it tells the students to solve this problem, a very simple example and then watch the video to check if your answer is correct, okay. That is part 2 and part 3 for teacher A is to go to one word problem about a carpet. I am just going to show you the transcript. Uh, there is a width of a carpet. So, what happens is there is a carpet, length is so much, diagonal is so much, what is the width? So, let us go back to the slides now. So, teacher A asks students to watch a 10 minute video, read the transcript, work the example and then check the answer and watch a second video of, an exam, uh, of a word problem. This happens out of class, okay. And in class, this teacher A spends about half an hour or maybe 20 minutes getting students in groups of 4, 3 let us say groups of 3 to solve a word problem, a slightly more real life problem that a student may have encountered. So, I am just going to read out this problem. Uh, you are playing badminton in your garden and the shuttlecock has accidentally landed on the top of a wall which is 12.5 feet high. Please do not solve the problem, just listen to what the problem is. You have a 13 feet ladder which is stable only if its base is placed at least 5 feet from the wall. Will you be able to reach the shuttlecock? So, in class, this teacher asks her 6 standard students to solve this problem in groups of 3. And this is a problem which most 6 standard students can relate to, yeah. So, she spends about 20 minutes helping students solve this problem as they sit around in groups and doing it. And then another 30 minutes or so where students come up with a geometrical proof of the Pythagorean theorem. So, the class has tiles on the floor and they have rulers and uh, chalk pieces and measuring tape and so on. So, in class time of about one hour is spent on these two activities and a little bit of clarification as and when they arise. So, this is classroom A. I am going to leave this slide for about 20 seconds. You can later go back to it locally, but just try to understand what the teacher does. This also tells you how much thought the teacher needs to put in before devising a flipped classroom. Okay, let us quickly now go to teacher B and then you can do the activity. Teacher B goes to the same site, okay. And I am not going to show it to you, but I will tell you what all the teacher asked the students to view. 
the intro video, the Pythagorean theorem 2, which had what it meant and the worked example. This teacher, classroom B, asked students to watch a second video with that example, where the first teacher had actually said, read transcript and solve the problem, then watch. The second teacher says, watch the example, watch videos of the fishing boat and carpet, two word problems. And there is one more at the bottom on distance formula, what is the distance between two uh, points which makes use of the Pythagorean theorem. So, the teacher, teacher B assigns all these for uh, out of class viewing. In class, this teacher spends a lot of time on discussing doubts. He understands that look, students may not have understood all these concepts. So, he may repeat, so maybe some student says, well, I did not understand the distance formula, can you please explain? So, teacher B then goes on and re-explains the distance formula. And then he uh, also does the fishing boat problem and the carpet problem and one more ladder problem because many students said they did not understand it. Maybe he does two out of these on the board. Okay, this is teacher B. So, what you can do at this point is look at these questions. See, I won't be able to put up all the slides together, so I'm going to have to ask you to do it locally. Did they do active learning? Uh, did the instructor repeat concepts? Did they spend most of the time clarifying? Uh, does Do the in-class activities address higher order thinking skills? Is there opportunity for peer instruction and instructor in interaction? Uh, how well did the activity connect to video and so on? So, there is a bunch of questions about the in-class component and there are some about the out-of-class component also. So, I hope you are all ready to begin the activity. This was explaining the activity so far. So, think. Think if you do not know what this means, it means pick up your pen and paper. It does not mean just think. Individual activity, think. Write one pro and one con for each strategy classroom A and classroom B. So, I am going to give you 3 to 4 minutes for this. If you have any questions about this activity, you can pose it in the, you can put it up in the chat or uh, in the questions. But at this point, you all have to be uh, writing each one of you individually, one pro and one con. If you want to look at what the two implementations were or what is the checklist, please ask your uh, local uh, workshop coordinator. He or she would be able to go back and forth between the slides. Uh, we have a video of each of your classrooms, so we can actually peek into what you are all doing. So, if you are sitting and watching the screen, it is really not very useful and that is not the purpose of this uh, synchronous interaction. So, please do this activity, pick up your pen, pick up your paper and write the answer to this question. In the next phase, we will ask you to talk to each other. Okay, let us move on to the pair phase now. Here, turn to your neighbor first. And each of you has written one pro and one con. So, together come up with a set of two pros and two cons for each implementation. And once you have it, start discussing with your neighbor which implementation did you think was better. Okay, so, we will give you some time for it, five to seven minutes. Uh, together talk to each other, come up with two pros and cons, use the checklist. I am going to put up the checklist in a few minutes and decide which implementation you think is better. So, this is the pair phase. So, this is the time when you have to be talking with your neighbor. Again, this is not the time when you have to be staring at the screen. Discuss with your neighbor. Uh, workshop coordinators, please facilitate each participant to discuss the answers with their neighbor and do the pair phase activity. Yeah, so we see that uh, some of you are not still paired up. Uh, just turn to your neighbor and start discussing. You have nearly 5 minutes more for the discussion. So, center 1242 KLE society, we, uh, some of you are talking to each other, but most of you are not. So, this is the pair phase activity. Please go ahead. Center 1073, we see you have a few participants, but there is an active discussion going on. This is really nice to see. Yeah, center number 1057. You also have very few participants, but I see that all of you are engaged in discussion. Keep it up. Uh, this is a very good practice. SGS Institute RC1116, very
very good i see a lot of discussions coming up and a lot of people yes uh, yeah. people towards the back rows please kindly be active okay let's go to the uh, share face so here the rc coordinator or the workshop coordinator who's present has a big role to play you have to please lead the discussion within your remote center so collate the various pros and cons that the different participants in your center have come up with so you can have a discussion you can do a hand raise anyhow you want within your discussion and then come to a consensus on whether classroom a or classroom b is uh, more effective and once you have come to a consensus you don't have to start writing in chat right away please wait for a couple of minutes have this discussion come up with a reason why uh, you think the rc is more effective and then send it by a chat about 20 rcs have responded so far we have a total of about 110 or more than that today so please post when we have a few more rcs we will take up your answers okay we see a lot of answers coming in and uh, one good thing is that uh, it's almost 50 50 between classroom mm -hmm. a and classroom b more a but uh, yeah now i think more number of a's okay uh, we're really happy to see a lot of active discussion and active involvement via the chat window so let's do let uh, what we'll do now is try to summarize what you have said what the various rcs have said because we have a log of all your chat answers and then we will take a few more questions on this activity if you'd like so as uh, jay krishnan mentioned we have a lot of answers and lot of reasons for both a and b and in fact when we posed this activity we did not mean for either of these implementations to be you know we, we we wanted to give two real life examples where there are pros and cons in each example and it's really up to each of you to analyze it and see which pro and which con make sense to you having said that let's actually go through some of the specific characteristics so if you i'm going to put back the slide on um, the implementation itself so that we recall what is happening let's look at the implementation for a so in the so i'm now only reading out the strategies so if you could all please uh, pay attention for the next 5 minutes and then you can post more questions so end the discussion in your rc not end but let's say hold off on the discussion in your rc for a few more minutes see if you look at classroom implementation a this person had three videos to watch outside of class but it was not merely watching watch the first one which had the introduction and a very simple solved examples do the second example so this was actually a problem for the students and then self assess their answers and watch a third one and all three are about the the main pythagorean theorem and applications of it teacher b on the other hand has asked students to watch videos 1 2 3 4 and 5 so more number to watch and only watch and 1 2 3 and 4 are the main pythagorean theorem and its applications 5 is actually a newer concept and perhaps that's why classroom b got more questions on the distance formula so if you look at the checklist now what you will see is let's look at the videos themselves okay are the size length appropriate and are the number of concepts uh, small enough for the students to be able to follow along because here they are doing it in self learning mode in the out of class part what is recommended is that when you select videos to assign for out of class component or especially when you create your own videos that the video length be really short and by short it can be as short as 2 or 3 minutes preferably under 5 minutes and under no circumstances go beyond 8 or 10 minutes so most of the khan academy videos are also short you will see a few going up to 12 or 13 minutes but keep them under 5 because there's a lot of research that shows lot of empirical data from all around the world that shows that the students attention span just i mean it it declines it goes away after the first 3 or 4 minutes so even if you have a beautiful 30 or 60 minute video students just don't watch it okay so keep really short videos is the first recommendation 
and the second one is that let the videos or the screencast be modular. This is mostly about getting familiar with new information. So keep one or at most two concepts per video per screencast. The third recommendation is that if you are assigning work out of class, remember your students will also come in class. So if you overload them out of class, they will just not do anything. We found that, that uh, the time that they spend out of class has to be manageable. So don't assign a lot of things for them to do out of class. So in that sense, uh, teacher B or teacher A has done one nice thing. She has tried to keep students attention by not just watching videos one after the other, but also has given a small self-assessment task in between. So at least a sincere student will be interested in doing this, will not get bored. We had a few questions on what to do if students don't watch videos, we will come to that in a few minutes. Teacher B on the other hand has only asked students to watch. So while it seems like they have uh, covered larger material, it's the last one is really uh, not, not connected directly. It will come in the following week or following day, but it is a bit of an overload that the teacher B has been assigning. Okay, so that is one difference. I am going to take a comment on uh, teacher on these in class uh, on these out of class component. Uh, one of you said that look what teacher B has been doing is very structured and the time management aspect is good. I am not sure how many of you agree with this. Again, what one can definitely conclude is that teacher B has assigned a lot of videos to watch out of class including word problems and examples. So, teacher B from his side has done all the work correctly. But what teacher B does not know is whether students have really understood all of these heavy concepts together. So doing things, assigning a lot of structured work is not the same as students understanding all of it. Okay, so that is one comment. If you come to the in-class part, teacher B has done a lot more active learning in class. Teacher B has made sure that students are solving this problem. So any doubts that they have come out at this point. One RC had made a comment that there is no room for discussion in teacher A. This is not valid because there is a lot of discussion happening here both between students, between small groups of students and the teacher and as a whole class. So while the teacher may not say what doubts do each of you have, the doubts naturally and automatically come out in this group solving, problem solving and in this second activity. The second thing teacher A has done is given really hard problems in class, especially the second one is a hard problem. So now whether this is good or not is up to the teacher. It depends on what her learning objectives are. If her objective is not to go all the way up to proofs, then she should not be doing the second activity. But if learning proofs of Pythagoras theorem, theorem is a part of the curriculum, is if that is something the teacher wants to emphasize, then this is an excellent way of uh, bringing together the proof because the students are working on their own, they are coming up with geometrical proofs and then there is a discussion and so on. So whether the second activity is good or bad really depends on whether it is part of the objectives or not. Uh, Let us look at teacher B. What happens, teacher B has, it looks like he has actually addressed a lot more questions. This may be valid that the structured way in which teacher B has answered questions seems to be better than teacher A. On the other hand, what teacher B is not sure of is how many students actually speak up. You may have some students who are not comfortable speaking up in a large class or uh, some students who get overwhelmed by the vocal ones in class, so they may not speak up. The other thing for teacher B is that these questions that come out are purely based on the watching. It is not based on whether students have tried to apply their knowledge and have tried something on their own. Teacher B seems to demo a lot of problems, useful but not sufficient because the students are not solving the problems on their own. Okay. So, uh, I will see if JK has some other comments here and then we will take a couple of your specific doubts. So, uh, 
there is one uh, small thing that I uh, wish to uh, put over here, which has been al uh, already been talked by Professor Sahanamoti. It is the number of videos. So just think of, uh, this is something that I heard from uh, a, a senior uh, professor. Uh, be it the student or the teacher, everyone has a fixed 24 hours in a day. And uh, by assigning too many videos outside the classroom, you are actually cramping the child uh, outside the classroom. So uh, a typical rule of thumb that we should follow is uh, think of uh, total study time to be constant. So typically the number of videos that you should give uh, should not be more than uh, two or three. And uh, these should ideally be less than half an hour of viewing in totality. So that is one half of a lecture. So if you have a one hour class, provide videos of half an hour where students are able to grasp the concept. This is a rule of thumb. It is not like a mandatory that you should only give half an hour, but it's a rule of thumb that in it is manageable of. chunks and 30 minutes should not be continuous. It should be in manageable chunks. So it should be small, small videos, uh, maybe five to six minutes. Uh, do not go beyond 10 minutes. Uh, we have uh, we have also seen. So uh, one thing that you should uh, know that we also have analytics of how you have watched the videos. So we have seen across. So uh, typically our videos were of length four to six minutes uh, throughout this particular flip classroom, and we have seen that only um, very few have gone beyond five minutes. So think of how your students will uh, watch the videos. So having videos less than five minutes is ideal, but if there is no way, try to restrict it less than 10 minutes. Okay, a uh, couple of comments from you that I'm trying to address. That's why I'm looking at my other screen. Uh, for teacher B, some of you have said that, look, more examples are, sol are solved and it's more sequential. That, that is true, but again, I'm making the same point. You don't know, you have solved the example or the teacher has solved the examples. You don't know if students know how to solve these examples just because they they have watched it. So most research from uh, the learning sciences, empirical research as well as theories say that for learning, you have to do things on your own. And this should not come as a surprise to you because if I had asked you, how do you learn best? You would say, well, if I do it. So. What teacher A is trying to do is to get the students to do, do things, not just watch things. Uh, the other question that has come up is what to do in rural areas, what can be done out of class instead of videos? You know, maybe it, it may be difficult for internet access and so on, uh, or it may be difficult because they may not have the uh, you know, systems to watch videos. So some things people have tried instead of videos are screencasts, which are essentially narration, voice narration with, that's also a video of sorts, except that it's not a teacher speaking. It's, uh, it, there's a screen share or a, it, it, you may have heard of uh, software like Cam Studio, Camtasia, Jing and so on, where there's a recording of what happens on the screen. So this is very effective for programming and other things. We'll come to it in a lab today and tomorrow. And uh, you can have podcasts, you can have audio material, you can give books, reading from books, which is what traditionally we have been doing. But the idea is to look at, to ask students to read or watch or hear specific content and make them do some self-assessment uh, exercises on them. Uh, go to different websites, see what's there on that website, explore a website, that's also valid. Uh, the last question we'll take from this activity is how to motivate students, maybe they won't watch the videos outside of class. And I think many of you may have had this uh, concern. It also came on one of the discussion forums, I think, that what to do. And this is a genuine concern, it's a valid concern. I can only share what people have done so far. Uh, one is that the learners have to be convinced that what they're doing outside of class is actually useful and necessary. So if their in-class activity is based on what they have seen outside of class, they're more likely to see it. So maybe you have a short 10 minute quiz, very simple quiz based on their out of class video watching. 
or maybe you have an online quiz that they have to do before they come to class based on the video watching, especially now that you will be starting to teach in blended mode and so on. If you look at what teacher A did in our example, the in class activity of the ladder and all could not have been done without watching the videos. So, students who did not watch the video would be kind of sitting in class not knowing what to do. So, you, you have to try some mixture of a carrot and stick to uh, ensure that students watch the videos. You may not get 100 percent, but try to go as high as you can, maybe 80, maybe 75 and so on. On the flip side, if you say that well all students listen when I lecture, that is you know that is not valid, maybe it is only the first two rows, first two benches which hear you. So, while you cannot police people watching videos outside, you can at least make sure that what they do after that is directly dependent on the out of class component. So, apart from that, uh, so one more strategy that uh, some people have tried out is uh, providing the content in uh, USB. So, this is specifically to the rural area. So, we have uh, one of our research scholar has tried this where he has recorded flip, uh, his uh, programming exercises and given the content in a CD or a DVD which is then shared among all the students. So, uh, this was found to be useful as most of the uh, students had at least the TVs, they had TVs which accepted USB drives and they could watch the videos in their TVs and they could then relate to it. He said that uh, nearly 90 percentage of the students had watched the video before coming to the class in, in using such a methodology. So, even that is recommended. Another thing is, so if you are or uh, have slides, take printout of slides, present it in a booklet form and distribute among your students. So, even that is equally good, all the information necessary information will be present in the slides. So, you can uh, put in examples one slide after the other as uh, and then uh, let the students go through it individually. Okay. So, now that we have done an activity and had a very engaging discussion, a uh, lot of good points came out in this discussion. So, we have summarized RC responses and discussed various pros and cons of each implementation. And in our discussion, what has come out is that each implementation, both A and B contain both pros, <coughs> some pros and some cons. It is really up to you to decide based on your objectives and also based on what uh, people who have tried this have recommended for uh, you know, effective learning. And most uh, of the empirical results and the research results as well as anecdotal evidence of our own colleagues show that if you lean more towards what teacher A has done with some elements of teacher B that seems to be effective. Doing what B alone has done or doing only what B has done is not as effective as taking some elements, some of the good elements of B and putting it into A's implementation. You may be a little uncomfortable in the beginning and the students will be even more uncomfortable because they are not used to doing things in class. But what we have found from experience is that it takes about three instances of trying something out and then they get comfortable. So, just start doing it from the first session, first week in your class and by the third week you will have all of them on board. You, the first thing is you have to get over your own discomfort. It is not going to be easy the first couple of weeks, but stick through it. Each of us has found that by week 3 everybody thinks it is very natural and they want to do more problems, they want to discuss and you will see that your class has a more lively and engaging atmosphere. So, before we break for tea, uh, let us look at where all you have encountered flipped classroom in this faculty development program. We have been, what we have been doing in the last two weeks is actually a flipped classroom. How so? So, in the last week, Think of the last week that you watched the videos as the out of class component. So, you were doing, you were learning about flipped classroom using a flipped technique. You got information on this new topic which was the flipped method. You watched videos and you had short assignments, short knowledge quizzes. So, you were in the role of a learner learning the information about flipped method in the out of class part last week. Today and tomorrow you can consider as the in class component, where you are applying, you are assimilating, you are, uh, you have not yet done design activities that is coming up, 
uh, but you applied your knowledge that you learnt in the last week to do this pros and cons analysis. So now the idea is that you can do something similar whether you are teaching purely in a face to face classroom mode or in a blended teaching format. So regarding how to do it, what we have come up with is something called a flipped classroom activity constructor and which has a lot of, uh, it is like a worksheet where you decide what your domain is you, and you decide what should be the out of class and what should be the in class component. You will be working with this constructor all of today after tea, after lunch in the lab and so on. So you will essentially be filling up this constructor. Okay, so typically it takes more than 10 or 15 minutes to create a TPS activity for your class and we are well aware of it. But the reason we gave a short time for this initial part is twofold. One is that you are already familiar with TPS and you are already doing your resource creation assignment from last week's uh, online segment. The second is that in this live session we wanted to focus a little bit more on the review part now because that is something we have not spent much time on. Uh, so if you have not finished or if you have only done some parts, no problem, you can always come back to it. Uh, the idea and I completely understand that it does take a lot more. In fact, writing a good TPS typically will take or should take more than 10 minutes. So now that you have uh, filled in the introductory aspects and also written some parts or all the uh, parts of a TPS activity, what we will do now is a peer review of these activities. So before we actually go ahead and do it and see how to do it, let us talk a little bit about why a peer review is essential at all and what is the also why, why is it essential and what are some benefits if you do it in your classroom. So let us look at it from a slightly broader perspective and we are preparing our students to enter the workforce or go on to do future research. Uh, these are maybe second or third year or fourth year BTEC students and so on. And they in any place where they will go on in their further professional lives, they will be working in teams. And Professor Fatak this morning talked at great length and he explained the importance of collaboration, not just for bettering one's own learning, but also as getting prepared for people's, for students uh, professional lives. Now if you look at one's own learning, what happens when someone does peer review is if you are the person who is doing the activity, who is creating an assignment, so you are the reviewee, you get feedback from either domain experts or your peers who are also on their way to becoming domain experts. So there is a lot of feedback you get right then and there. As researchers when you write papers you get feedback from your colleagues, from the reviewers, again they are your peers. So we are preparing our students to accept, to give and accept such feedback. As the reviewer again the benefits are enormous. One, the reviewers own uh, concepts and domain knowledge get strengthened because they are applying it, they are evaluating it and what we will provide here and what a lot of reviewers have is a checklist or a set of criteria. So when you apply the criteria to somebody else's TPS, your understanding of how to write a good TPS itself uh, becomes better. And finally for the community as a whole, there is collaboratively community resources are being built. So within your RC itself there may be anywhere between 5, you know 3 to 20 TPS activities being written and evaluated. So there is a quality check uh, and so on. So this peer review is not about criticism, it is about giving constructive feedback for the other group to improve their uh, written assignment which they will go ahead and implement next uh, semester. Okay, so the, those are the guidelines. Uh, Having said this, let us go to the how of the peer review. So what we have for peer review of the TPS design is actually some criteria, its appropriateness, the time that a student is likely to take for each phase, the alignment between the phases, all these criteria are something that we have discussed in the videos last week. One such criterion is something you see at the end that every phase, the think, the pair and the share phase should include a clear deliverable for the student. 
that they have to either come up with two items or critique something or come to a consensus. It is not simply think about this or solve the problem, a very clear focused deliverable is required. So, what we will do in the next I would say 15 minutes is actually implement this activity. So, the RC coordinators need to help us a little bit again. You have to find another group or another pair which you think will be able to understand the think pair share activity that you have created. So, somebody who is ideally in the same domain and same course, but at least in the same domain. Exchange each other's TPS activities and give feedback on each of these criteria. Is this there, is this not there, if not there how can they improve and so on. So, first get up, look around, find another pair or another group that will work with you, exchange your uh, responses, your creations, work on giving feedback you know, uh, in the notebook or something for about uh, 6 to 7 minutes and then discuss with the other pair and then they will replicate. If there are any questions about the logistics, please let us know via chat. Uh, otherwise, we will keep quiet for the next 10 to 15 minutes and allow you to do a peer review and then we have a wrap up about the peer review itself. Okay. Uh, the specific instruction for all uh, participants is by this time, all of you would have done a designed a small TPS activity as a pair. Find a group. Uh, within your remote center who would understand your uh, think pair share activity and each one of you have to review the others, exchange your TPS designs and then review the TPS based on these broad criteria of appropriateness, time, alignment and deliverable. So, the characteristic is given, uh, appropriateness is whether each of these think face, pair face and share face questions are appropriate. The time is basically whether uh, they have devoted sufficient amount of time for each of these phases. Alignment is, is there connection between the think, pair and share faces and deliverable is have the TPS design provided clear deliverables from the students at the end of think pair and share faces. These are the checklists. So, remember you did the pros and cons analysis using some triggering questions. So, these are the questions for doing peer review of TPS. Some of you uh, have been asking can this be submitted in the May 17th assignment. Uh, so, the very purpose is that we are helping you in submitting the May 17th assignment. What you have to submit in the first week's output is a more refined think pair share. So, what you get right now is feedback from your peers about your designed think pair share strategy. So, you can act on it and incorporate the comments that have been provided to you and then submit a refined TPS. The submissions uh, are due till May 17th. So, I hope all of you will make use of this activity and uh, it is going to help you in your own. So, it is not just going to help you in uh, submission, it is also going to help you in the peer review because most of these uh, criteria are taken from the same rubric. The criteria are same as that of the rubric. We have not elaborated the criteria, that is all. But otherwise, all the probing questions are the same. Okay, so I hope this gave some flavor of how to do the peer review which uh, you will anyway have to do as an assignment uh, as part of last week's uh, activities or online activities. So, what we want to do now very quickly is we are going to start a poll here. So, we are, we are going to start polling and what you can do as the workshop coordinator or RC coordinator is to see how many, uh, see the majority answer from your remote center and vote what your center's response is. The question is how many gave peer review in your RC? Only a few participants, most participants or all participants. So, please let us know. We have started the poll. Okay, looks like 
close to 70 centers have given us responses, which are somewhere between most participants and all participants. That's quite useful to know. Thank you. Uh, the next question is something that we would like you to answer, uh, think a little bit and, and answer. So the next question is, how useful was the peer review to you as a reviewee, as somebody receiving the feedback? Okay. Uh, so the four choices are it was very useful and I can immediately act on the comments or it was useful but I need time to act on it. It was somewhat useful because not all review points were clear and it was not useful. So here you would need to answer this individually and then the RC coordinator please let us know. Please take some time to think about this because regardless of what you say there are further things you will have to do here. Okay, looks like close to 90 people have given uh, a response and it seems like about 65 to 70 are saying that the review was useful but I need more time to act on it. And this is something that's really expected because as soon as you get review, it's not possible to know what to do immediately. As a reviewee, as somebody who receives comments, you have to now think about it, digest it, assimilate it, refine your assignment and so on. So this is exactly the process we will follow even online. Some of you have said that it was that not all review points were clear. So and I think about three or so centers have said that uh, it was not useful at all. So for these two groups, what I would suggest is to go and read the rubric again and maybe have a face-to-face -face debriefing or a discussion with both the reviewer and the reviewee team and see why it was not useful, uh, do, are more items needed in the rubric or is more time needed for the review process and so on. So you have the luxury right now of being able to talk to your reviewers. So try to spend a few more minutes over lunch uh, so that the review process and the review criteria and feedback do become useful. And what we'll do at this point is uh, just do a quick summary and overview of what we've done so far. This was a synchronous session, I mean not exactly face to face because we are only seeing your video and you're seeing our video, but synchronous and as close to face to face as we can get with 4,000 people. But if you noticed, there was a lot of back and forth between how much we spoke and how much you spoke or you did. It was not two and a half hours of lecture. There were some guidelines and some instructions that we had to give from our end. There was a lot of activity that you did from your end. And what we're trying to get at is that this is the sort of interaction that you can start thinking of for your own courses. Both in the online part as well as this in the synchronous face-to-face -face parts where you get the students, the learners themselves to apply, to do things and you can give feedback right away. This also is in line with the philosophy of active learning and it is possible to implement active learning whether you are in a face-to-face -face classroom, a small or a large classroom or in an online setting and so on. So 2 p.m. please reassemble in the classroom.